Since the recording of this service, the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth has been announced. Accordingly, the readings and reflection are appropriate to the 13th Sunday after Trinity, rather than during a period of mourning. Our service in church on Sunday will reflect the period of mourning. The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome on this beautiful sunny day. It's a joy to be outside. We've had so much variable weather lately, haven't we? We've had torrential rain, we've had droughts. It's now a bit like we normally expect this time of year. Pleasantly mild, not too severe. But in any case, I do hope it is nice weather wherever you are. If you would like to follow our lectionary readings in your own Bible, today they're from the prophet Jeremiah, Psalm 14, Paul's first letter to Timothy, and Luke's Gospel. We come from scattered lives to meet with God. Let us worship God now together, across the miles yet joined. And whilst the atrocities in Ukraine continue, we begin with a prayer for the people of Ukraine. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children, at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, as we prepare ourselves for a short period of worship, let us bring to mind the things that we've done and thought and said which were not right, which could have been better, what we've neglected to do and offer these to God in confession, and ask his forgiveness. Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Before our readings, we have the Collect for today, the 13th Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, who called your Church to bear witness that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself, help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be drawn to you, through him who was lifted up on the cross and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the prophet Jeremiah, beginning to read at chapter 4, verse 11. At that time this people and Jerusalem will be told, A scorching wind from the barren heights in the desert blows towards my people, but not to winnow or cleanse. A wind too strong for that comes from me, now I pronounce my judgments against them. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. The whole land will be ruined, though I will not destroy it completely. Therefore the earth will mourn, and the heavens above grow dark because I have spoken and will not relent. 
I have decided and will not turn back. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading from Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Paul's first letter to Timothy. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. The Parable of the Lost Sheep Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Praise to you, O Christ. I love cryptic crosswords. I really enjoy the thrill of, of wrestling with some obscure clue and then finally working out what the answer is. And sometimes I laugh with delight at having worked it out, realising how obvious the answer was hidden within the clue all the time. We can see a bit of that in today's scripture readings. In Jeremiah, God is still angry with the people of Israel for having turned their backs on him. I think we're getting a bit of a repeat message here. Been having this for the last few weeks. So God is still angry and they continue to seem to be unable to correlate the awful things that are happening to them with the way that they've been living their lives. Do we recognise any similarities 
with the state our world is in now and the way we've been living, I wonder. God is giving them fair warning about how dreadful things might become if they don't change their ways. If they can't see it for themselves, the answer, as the scripture writer tells us, and as Bob Dylan once sang, is blowing in the wind. Yes, and how many times can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? Those lines from that song not only seem to sum up how the people of Israel are living their lives in the time of Jeremiah, but how we are living our lives today. It's shocking, really, the way we pretend that the privations we're suffering now are not really anything to do with how we've been living our lives. I love the reading from Psalm 14. It reminds me of a story told about someone who went to court to complain that there were lots of days of celebration for people who were religious, Easter, Christmas and so on, but that he, as an atheist, was missing out because there were no such days for him. Now, this chap spent lots of money on expensive lawyers and they were diligent in preparing their case until finally the great day came and they turned up at court and put forward the man's arguments that religious people were being favoured because there were no days of celebration for atheists. The judge listened carefully to what was said, then answered, Psalm 14 tells us, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. So, there's already a day for atheists, all fool's day. Case dismissed. Now, I'm sure it's apocryphal, but it's a lovely story and I wish it were true. But on a more serious note, this psalm is not concerned with the theoretical atheism that challenges faith today, but continues the warnings of Jeremiah of the practical outcomes of living as though God did not exist. The psalmist laments the way in which the world seems entirely to be run on human selfishness and self-centeredness. As he sees it, there is no one who does good, and he grieves at the cost of wickedness. A cost that is borne chiefly, as is so often the case, by the poor. But along with mourning comes judgment. The selfishness of the wicked reflects a fundamental lack of wisdom. Those judged to be corrupt fail to recognise that, from a heavenly perspective, all the children of earth are made to be responsible for one another. Those who reject this heavenly wisdom create a sterile and joyless world. Sound familiar? Yet God does not give up on the world of his creation. He is present in the company of the few who do act justly, and he continues to protect the helpless. In small ways, his people still bear witness to the joyful promise that God holds out to humanity, a promise that will come from Zion. From a Christian viewpoint, this is a prophecy that looks towards the age of the Messiah, the coming of the King of Righteousness and Peace. For us, it means that our small daily efforts to live fairly and responsibly are infinitely worthwhile. When Paul writes to Timothy in our epistle reading, he tells of how, despite his previous life during which he viciously persecuted Christians, he is now benefiting from God's mercy as a follower of Christ. He is telling Timothy that, despite what has gone before, there is always hope of forgiveness in Christ. But it's when we get to Luke's Gospel reading uh, that we, we hunt for answers to a cryptic clue. When Jesus tells a story about lost stuff, it's a sure thing that everybody will be able to engage with it. We all put things down and then forget where we put them, or they fall down behind something and then we turn the house upside down trying to find them. Now my study is a mess of papers, but I usually know where to find anything. But when I can't find something, it's that feeling of rising panic. We all know what it's like when things go missing. And today we're told that all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to listen to him. In other words, Jesus is creating a storm and the people that he is attracting are some of the ones who would not normally go and listen to a religious person. Jesus is actually having the opposite effect. These are the very ones who find Jesus in a message which they can understand and feel comfortable with. Of course, this is not going down well with the Pharisees and religious teachers who were angry with what Jesus was saying. A shepherd leaves his sheep 
to go and look for something lost. Now it's a huge risk, but the thing which is lost is valuable, and therefore it is worth taking that risk and going to search. A woman loses a coin. She doesn't just ignore it and hope it'll turn up. It's of sufficient value that it's worth turning the house upside down and going to look for it. Now this message is not lost on those who hear these words. God takes time, takes effort, takes a risk and considers that which is lost to be worth his time and energy getting it back safely. And this is part of the answer to the cryptic clue. Jesus asks an interesting question. Which one of you, having 100 sheep and losing one, would leave the 99 in the wilderness and search for the lost one? If we think about this logically, it's not particularly clever to leave them in the wilderness. Quite rightly, the answer should be that nobody would do that. Jesus asks again, which one of you, having ten coins and losing one, would sweep the house all day long until it was found, and then call your friends for a party? Now, I know how pleased I feel when I find my lost papers, but I have to say that when I find them, I, I never throw a party to celebrate. So the honest answer to the second question is most likely the same as the first. Nobody would do that. So we need to think carefully about what Jesus is getting at. The first thing which stands out is that Jesus chooses numbers which are significant. There are a hundred sheep and there are ten coins. If one is lost, then we have ninety-nine sheep and nine coins. And it's immediately apparent that this is a number which lacks completion. The numbers speak for themselves, that there's something missing. There is another important truth which comes across from the parable. Now, hands up if you're in the group of 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, surely we all know that each one of us is really a sinner who God wants to save. Perhaps that's why the shepherd fails to go and check on the 99 righteous ones. They simply don't exist. Here's another part of the answer to the clue. There are no 99 good ones. We're left with the understanding that Jesus has been playing with us. What Jesus is really saying is that there are, really are not 99 sheep which can be left in the wilderness unprotected. Humanity is lost. All have gone astray. In other words, all of humanity is represented by the one lost sheep. Now one thing which we know for certain is that Jesus knew his Bible and the scriptures in the Old Testament make this clear. In Isaiah 53, it says, There is no such thing as a righteous sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now we could search the whole world over, and we'll never find 99 who need no repentance. The Pharisees might have thought that they were above reproach, but they were only fooling themselves and Jesus reserves his very worst condemnation for them and their hypocrisy. There's a lovely line in the 23rd Psalm, which is perhaps one of the finest pieces of scripture which we have, and which uses this picture of God as being like a caring shepherd. The Psalm concludes with the statement, Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, I had enough difficulties at college learning Greek of the New Testament, I'm afraid the Hebrew of the Old Testament was a step too far. However, my commentaries tell me that these words shall follow are not a great translation. A better translation into the English would be this. Surely your goodness and mercy shall track me down all the days of my life. Jesus knew that psalm and he makes sense of it in this parable. He shows a God who tracks us down and will not let go because if he does then what he has will never be complete. My joy at solving a cryptic crossword clue is nothing compared to the joy of knowing that God will always track me down whenever I'm lost and bring me home rejoicing. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. 
firm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us intercede for others as we pray. Everlasting God, as you look down on our church family assembled here in church and online, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together. Thank you for the love that unites us, for the peace we enjoy today and for the hopes we have for tomorrow. We thank you for the health we enjoy, for the work that keeps us cheerfully occupied, for the food that sustains us, for the beauty around us that makes our lives delightful and for our friends in every corner of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask you to guide your church especially when differences among us seem to threaten our relationship with each other. 
we face each other, but often do not see the face, we too easily make another of one another. Help us now to look again, to see Jesus in the face, and to recognise hopes, aspirations and desires. Creator God, we pray for our new Prime Minister Liz Truss and party leaders as they negotiate the political future of our nation. We pray for those who represent our communities in Parliament, for the media as they interpret events, and for ourselves and our future under our new Prime Minister. We pray for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Almighty God, who has set our gracious Sovereign Queen Elizabeth upon the throne of this realm, and given her to surpass all others in the years of her reign, receive our heartfelt thanks for her service to her people, confirm and encourage her in the continuance of the same, and keep her in thy heavenly wisdom through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took the form of a servant for our sake, and reigneth now in glory with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Father God, Help us to recognise the people in our lives who need someone to stand up for them. Forgive us for thinking that it is not our problem and help us to always love our family, friends and neighbours as ourselves, especially praying for those who do not carry the cross and follow Jesus as a disciple. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, sometimes life seems out of control and we don't know exactly which direction to take especially when we are or someone else we know is ill. Thank you for overseeing our lives and prompting us in the right direction through your word and your spirit. We raise before you those on our prayer lists and those who we care about. Let's keep a moment of silence as we pray for those close and dear to us. Father God, we ask you to draw close to all those we pray for, so that they may be aware of your presence, and we ask you to provide your peace and comfort for them at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, remember those who have died and for those who are saddened by their passing. Be with all the bereaved in their loneliness, and give them the faith to look beyond their present troubles. To your Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, and who lives forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we praise you for all you have done in the past. We look forward with thankfulness for all you will do in the future. And we thank you for today, for never giving up on us, and for all your blessings we experience. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, let us pray with confidence the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, that completes our short service of morning worship, and as ever, I hope it's been of some comfort to you. It's a, a real joy to be out while the sun is shining, so making the most of it, and I hope you can where you are too. Our church continues to be open, but uh, if you are able to join us, uh, put a date in your diaries. In a couple of weeks' time, the 25th, Sunday the 25th of September, we're moving our service to 11 o'clock. It's a special day, it's Harvest Festival, and we're celebrating our Patronal Festival of Michaelmas a few days early. But more than that, we've got a special visitor in the Archdeacon of Sunderland, the Venerable Bob Cooper, who's coming to lead our service. And after the service, we'll have a buffet lunch in the community centre, free to all, so please come along. Uh, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to share our time together and celebrate the harvest. So that is 11 o'clock on Sunday, the 25th of this month, September. 
I'd like to thank all who've taken part in this service, all who contribute to the service, and all who continue to support the church. It is vitally important, but very much appreciated. I look forward to being with you again next week. But meanwhile, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.